ways of mercy tend to and end in my delight. Thou didst weep, sorrow, suffer, that I might rejoice. For my joy thou hast sent the comforter, multiplied thy promises, shown me my future happiness, given me a living fountain. Thou art preparing joy for me and me for joy. I pray for joy Wait for joy, long for joy. Give me more than I can hold, desire, or think of. Measure out to me my times and degrees of joy at my work, business, duties. If I weep at night, give me joy in the morning. Let me rest in the thought of thy love, pardon for sin, my title to heaven, my future unspotted state. I am an unworthy recipient of thy grace. I often disesteem thy blood and slight thy love, but can in repentance draw water from wells of thy joyous forgiveness. Let my heart leap toward the eternal Sabbath 
where the work of redemption, sanctification, preservation, glorification is finished and perfected forever, where thou wilt rejoice over me with joy. There is no joy like the joy of heaven, for in that state there are no sad divisions, unchristian quarrels, contentions, evil designs, weariness, hunger, cold, sadness, sin, suffering, persecution, toils of duty. O healthful place where none are sick, O happy land where all are kings, O holy assembly where all are priests, how free a state where none are servants except to thee. Bring me speedily to the land of joy.
Good morning. All right, this morning I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I put the Lord to the test. Then he said, Listen now, house of David, is it too trivial a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Let's pray. Father God, thank you uh, for this morning, for another opportunity to, to come together as a, a family in corporate worship, Father. Thank you, though, that even though we struggle at times and it would be easy for us to become overwhelmed, we, we thank you for all that you've done for us in Christ in order that we might be who we are as Christians. Thank you that our identity is wrapped up ultimately not in our jobs, in our individual successes or our social statuses, but, but in our standing in Christ. We are tiny before your greatness and humbled before your love, and we thank you again for the privilege to worship and hear your word preached. Thank you for the Bible, for your word, and that the more we study it, the more we realize the wonder of it and how much we need to come back again and again to learn Christ. Accomplish your purposes this morning, we pray. Amen. You can remain standing as we sing. We'll do a little rehearsal here, and then we'll move on into the song. Sing all ye people the Lord Almighty reigns. Sing every creature of God come bless his name. For he is good, for he is good. He was born to conquer the grave. A light of the world, the reason for Christmas Day.
This week we'll be taking a brief break from the book of Matthew as we're reminded of how the word was made flesh and the mysteries therein. I'm going to be reading out of the book of 1 Timothy first, chapter 3, verse 16, and I'll be switching to the book of Colossians. 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And now Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself 
will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this sermon, Lord. We thank you that it can be nourishing to our spirits. Lord, I pray for this congregation as we hear it. Be with us, Lord. I pray for the congregation online. Renew their spirits through this as well, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you sent your Son as the Word made flesh, Lord, that he could come and conquer death so that we in our flesh would no longer have to fear fear death or all the ailments of this world, Lord. We pray in his name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. You know, in, in, the, in the early service, I had just a sense of just like a dark cloud. I was thinking when I looked at the stand over here, and you know, not being an Episcopalian in background, I don't know much about such things. However, you know, we Baptists, we tried, I guess. What is the word? Uh, be diverse, I guess. Anyway, I was thinking about that, and it reminded me that this past Wednesday night we had a, a meeting here with our missions committee. I met some people on Monday, and, and, and I was so impressed with what they were doing that I said, you need to meet with our missions committee, and we met called the meeting Monday afternoon we met Wednesday night and the reason I thought about that was because again she's Episcopalian she knew what all the candles stood for but I told Brenda I said you know it, it'd be very possible that one day you'd see this young lady's picture her name is Helena and she's from a family in Delaware she's educated at Oxford Middle Eastern relations. She speaks Farsi and Arabic fluently. And she's working with displaced Christians from Iraq in Jordan. And they're displaced. They're not even refugees. They don't have refugee status. They can't work legally. It is a very bad situation that these Christians are in. And so as a missions committee, we, we had funds from this year that we applied some of those funds to help them. And, and we're going to be doing more. We're going to have some people that are going to speak in church in April. Uh, Max Wood is a colonel, a retired colonel. He's been in the State Department. Uh, he works in the Trump administration right now, but that job will be coming to an end shortly. Um, but he, he, he is very dedicated to this and he said part of the reason that he's so dedicated to it is because the policies of our government beginning with the Bush administration in 2002 and 2003 and followed up by the Obama administration has caused many of the problems that now exist in Iraq for Christians there uh, this meeting that we had Wednesday was called in two days and I love the way he started the meeting. He said, you know, thank you all for coming to this meeting. I know you had short notice, but think about this. 250,000 Christians in northern Iraq and the Kurdistan region around Mosul and that part, and it really where Nineveh was in ancient times, had less than 24 hours to leave or die. Think about that. 24 hours, not point. where you're going. Some had cars, some didn't. Sold everything they had. Some could buy tickets to plane to get out. Others couldn't. But in 24 hours, they were gone. Many of them that weren't able to leave were murdered by ISIS. So I said that, one, to make you aware of what we're doing as a church and of a opportunity that we have and secondly to say this in this area of the world do you realize that there in that part of the world in northern Iraq 
in the, in the Nineveh region especially. Christianity existed peacefully. Even, even under 1,500 years of, of Islam, but they existed peacefully for almost 2,000 years. And now they've been disrupted. And I, I told you this a few weeks ago in a sermon, but two and a half million Christians in Iraq are now down to 120,000. That's astonishing. Christianity is becoming extinct in the place that it was born. Think about that. Think about that. In the place where the great councils were held, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chalcedon that we're going to talk about today, Christianity is almost non-existent. And that's why I think it's so important for us in our church and in our culture. I know that so many times today in America, and especially in the church, you know, it's a good time rock and roll, you know, how we can live better lives and do better and all this. Beloved, we don't have anything promised to us. Nothing's promised to us. So I think it, it behooves us as a people, as Christian people, to understand what we believe so that we can defend it and so that we can be a foundation of Christian belief where we are. Now, the doctrine I'm going to talk about this morning, I'm going to talk about a doctrine this morning. It's called the hypostatic union. It's, it, it, it is founded in the incarnation. Many of you probably have never heard a sermon on the hypostatic union. If you've been here very long, you have heard a sermon. You've actually heard this sermon. I'm going to preach it again because it's so important. But you might not have heard a sermon on the hypostatic union. You might not know what the hypostatic union is. I hope that when I'm done today, you will know. Secondly, and some of you might even have, you might hear this and maybe something in your background that makes you uh, not agree with this. Well, I would ask you to hear this in the, in the way I'm going to deliver it. I'm going to deliver it humbly and, and with the Holy Spirit, I, I believe in the Word of God attesting to this important truth. And I pray that you will all hear it in this way. And if you don't agree when it's over, that's fine. But just know this, that the importance of this doctrine. And if you say, maybe, maybe not agree is not the best way of putting it. I shouldn't have said that. Maybe if you just say when you leave, well, that's nice, but what difference does it make? Or what does it matter? It matters a great deal. It matters a great deal, not only for the future of Christianity, but it matters a great deal for you as a believer, as I'll show you at the end of the message. So enough with the introduction. Let's get into it this morning. So we're going to talk about the story of the God-man, theologically known as the hypostatic union. Scripture teaches us that in Jesus, this is in your outline, the heavenly and the earthly worlds unite. Some will admit that Jesus was a man, some will admit that Jesus was God, but the confession that the infinite deity and finite humanity reside in a single person brings us to the very heart of the Christmas story. Because again, it has its foundation in the incarnation, or it really expresses itself, I should say. It's not, the, the incarnation is foundational, or it has its foundation in this doctrine, and the incarnation is expression of this doctrine as it unfolds into reality. Traditionally, the union of God and man in Christ has been called the hypostatic union. It comes from two Greek words, but it translates personal. It's a very interesting translation. So complete, so indissoluble was this personal union that Christ is called not God and man, but the God-man. Now, of course, as he read from Timothy this morning, at the beginning of the verse, great is the mystery. And so our minds stagger before such teaching, and yet I say to you, this teaching is very important for us as Christians. So here's the question. 
How can deity with all of its perfections be joined to humanity with all of its limitations? Well, first of all, let me put this thought into your minds. We may think we know what humanity is, but we really don't. We, we talk about uh, humanity and about being human beings and doing the human thing. But we don't really understand humanity because we were created as human beings, and in the fall, our humanity was scarred and so marred that, again, it is difficult to understand what humanity was originally when man was created in the image of God. We know humanity in existential terms. In other words, our experience of it. But we do not know humanity in its essential terms. We don't know what it really the essence of humanity really is. We, we have some idea because humanity was not erased in the fall, but it was so marred that we can't truly understand what humanity is until we see Jesus, the Christ of God. In Jesus, we see perfect and essential humanity. The question is not whether Jesus was fully human. The question is, are we fully human? And we are humans in a depraved state. Now, in discussing this subject, I want us to think about three headings. First of all, the contesting of this union. Secondly, the confession of the union. And then thirdly, the comfort of this union. Men find it impossible to believe such a thing. So think with me as we think about the contesting of this union. I think about Nietzsche, the atheist, uh, the inventor of the concept of the superman. And Nietzsche said that, you know, the doctrine of Christology, of, of the incarnation and of the hypostatic union is a Christology of absurdities. He said that man cannot truly be man and at the same time be truly God. And I find that interesting from a man who doesn't believe in God. Tillich, Paul Tillich, the theologian, claimed that it was psychologically impossible for perfect God and perfect man to be one. Another liberal theologian said, J. John A.T. Robinson, that the idea makes about as much sense as trying to place two billiard balls in the same spots. Others pass it off as saying that Jesus was just more conscious of God's indwelling than, than we are. Others say that he was a special human being uh, through whom God chose to do his work. So the question is how the authentic God could also be the authentic man. And the question is not new. This question hasn't been asked just in the 20th and 21st century, but it was a great controversy in the first four centuries after Christ's resurrection and ascension. Someone has said that there are uh, six basic jokes, or, or seven basic jokes, and every joke is just a variation of one of these different kinds of jokes. A similar statement can be made about the heresies regarding the person of Christ. There are six heresies. They appear in different forms, but these six basic heresies have been around since the first century. And here they are. The first one is called Ebionism or Ebionism, which denies the genuineness of Christ's or Jesus' humanity. They taught, and this is where this teaching came, this idea came, that Christ received the Spirit at his baptism, that the Spirit of God fell upon him in a special way at his baptism, and that Jesus was not preexistent. And yet both texts that we read this morning say that Jesus was preexistent. In fact, the very idea of the Logos that you find in John chapter 1 
is a very interesting idea. Scholars argue as to whether it's a Hebrew idea or a Greek idea. We know that it's a Greek idea. We don't know to what extent the Hebrews adopted it. It began with Heraclitus in the 6th century B.C. Heraclitus was trying to describe how a transcendent God, a God of ideas and forms, which Aristotle later perfects, he is trying to explain explain how this God actuates things upon the earth. Philo, the first century Jewish philosopher who was a Neoplatonist, he was an Old Testament scholar. And so he was trying to understand how the transcendent God spoke and the idea of Logos comes in, in Old Testament thought, comes through this idea that God speaks and things come into existence. And so how does this, this transcendent God who is totally other, what is the medium of creation? How does a transcendent God interact with a material world. You say, well, he just does. I understand he does. But you, you understand that, that in thinking these thoughts, these are important thoughts. And I feel sorry for the Greeks because they, they had such good thoughts and, and, and ways of explaining things that later on you find out in both testaments that, that they were on to something, but not the revelation of God. What they had was common grace. It was not special grace, which is what we have and what the Old Testament writers had. So how does God interact with the world? Now, I've told you that, that the Holy Spirit, of course, is God's agent for actualization upon the earth but there's a there's an intermediary between those and we're still in the godhead the father the son and the holy spirit the son is the one who actuates the plan of god before the world was jesus was and in time Jesus, and this was always the plan, this was not some kind of plan B, this was always the plan that Jesus would become God incarnate. It was always the plan. And so he does become genuine deity as well as genuine humanity. Arianism denies the completeness of Jesus' deity, the completeness. They said that Christ was the first and highest created order from beings. And this kind of stems from the thought of Philo. It's a form of polytheism. It's something that Islam struggles with when you talk about the Trinity. And, Trin and they say that's, that's polytheism. And we say no, it's not polytheism because it's one being in three persons. Docetism denied the genuineness of Jesus' humanity. So the first two deal with his deity. The second one now deals with the genuineness of his humanity. They say that Jesus appeared human, but he was really divine only. Apollinarianism denied the completeness of Jesus' humanity. They said the divine Logos took on or took the place of the human spirit. Therefore, he would not be truly a man. Nestorianism separates his nature. They say the union was a moral one, but not a real one. So the human being was completely controlled by the divine. The idea is like this, that, you know, you, you've seen these, these horses where two people are going to take on this canvas top. One's the head and one's the tail, and, and they're underneath the canvas, this painted canvas of a horse. And they say this is what the natures of Christ was like. You, you, have, you have two people under one canvas. But no, that's not what the Bible teaches. Eutychianism 
confuses or mixes his nature. They say the human nature was swallowed up by the divine nature to create a third nature, a, a tertium quid. But if he were not really God or man, how could he redeem? So in the presence of these errors, the church gathered in A.D. 451 at a place called Chalcedon near Constantinople where 650 bishops came together to discuss and to reaffirm their belief in the Nicene, in the Nicene Creed and to formulate a, a statement on the person of Christ. The result was the Chalcedon Statement Chalcedon Creed, it is one of the most significant creeds in all of the church, the church's history. I want to quote from a brief section from the heart of this statement. They said, We confess and all teach with one accord, with one accord, one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once perfect in Godhead and perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, proclaimed in two natures. Now listen to this. These are very significant phrases. Without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The differences of the natures being in no way destroyed on account of the union, but rather the peculiar property of each nature being preserved. Not as though parted or divided in two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten of God, the Logos, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what you see in this confession is that the church affir affirmed the deity of Christ, His proper deity, His authentic humanity, the union of the divine and the human natures in a single person, and the proper distinctions of the two natures. So let's just go through those terms. First of all, without confusion, deity and humanity didn't mix. So if you take some ice and a banana and some strawberries and some yogurt and you put them in a blender, what you got? Apparently, you people don't make many smoothies, do you? <laughs> Got a smoothie. So you've taken these four separate things and you've, you've confused them and created a new thing. That's what you've done. It's a, it's a synthesis, if you will. A lot of cooking is like that. The, the incarnation did not produce a third substance. There's not a third substance. There's the God-man. Second, without change. Humanity was not swallowed up by deity, nor was de deity diminished by humanity. He was fully God, fully man. Without division. Our Lord's two natures cannot be isolated or parceled out, again like the illustration of the painted horse. Now here's how this, this is an important idea. So when Jesus was living upon this earth, when he slept in the boat, or when he raised Lazarus, when he sat down because he was tired, or when he walked on the water. He was not being more man in one case and more God in the other. We must not attribute any given action of Christ to one or the other of his natures. The Bible upholds one Lord Jesus, one God man, and everything must be attributed to this one person. without separation. Godhood and manhood have been forever joined together 
in Christ and they will never be separated. You see that in the book of Revelation. Now the Chalcedon Confession did not explain the mystery of the union. Because they couldn't. But they simply set the boundaries for the union, four of them that we have seen, that distinguishes the biblical view from all other views. And most of these views came via different philosophies. That was 1,500 years ago. We might want to say more than they did, but we should never say less than they did. Now think about this. When you see Jesus speaking in the Bible, he never speaks as the I thou. He never speaks as I in one place and as thou in the other. Jesus does not separate himself. He speaks as the I. Always the I. One person, two natures, and we have no sufficient analogies to explain the mystery. Sorry. But we can say this, the two natures of Christ never function independently. He did not exercise his deity at times and his humanity at others. His actions were always deity-humanity. For example, did Jesus possess omnipresence? Yes. But that attribute was limited by his physical body. Now, after his resurrection, that attribute was no longer limited, right? He appeared to the disciples. He he, he just appeared, materialized in front of them. When he materialized, he was real, but he was not limited by space and time. But in his pre-glorified body, he was. You say, well, how can that be? Well, it's a circumstance-induced limitation on the exercise of his power and capacities. That's it. It would be like this. Suppose the world's fastest sprinter. I don't know who that is. But just say the fastest sprinter in the world. Came to Bonaire and there was going to be an Olympic, a special Olympics kind of sort of, where he had to run a three-legged race with me. Do you think that might limit him in his abilities? Yeah, it would limit the exercise of his ability. His ability would still be the same. He'd still be the fastest runner in the world. But when, he, when he's tied with me, it's going to slow him down. I promise you. Or a boxer. What if a boxer, the world's greatest boxer, ties one hand behind, him, behind his back? Is he still the greatest boxer in the world? Yeah. But not in the exercise of that. Or the world's greatest hitter, of, of, a, of a baseball hitter. If he hits from the right side, if he's a right-handed hitter, and he's not a, he's not a switch hitter, and, and they say to him, you've got a, you've got a bat from the, from the left, will that diminish the exercise of his ability? Well, yes. But it doesn't diminish or erase the fact that he is still the world's greatest hitter. Now, I know those are simple analogies. But during the incarnation, Christ voluntarily imposed a limitation upon himself. And during that time, his deity always functioned in connection with his humanity. So there it is, the hypostatic union. Been taught in the church as orthodox teaching for 2,000 years, reaffirmed at Nicaea, Nicaea 
and reaffirmed and explained categorically at Chalcedon in 451 A.D. So how does that help us? Well, I want to remind you of something that I keep repeating in this. In Christ, we have all that we need. God gave him as our shepherd and our Savior. Aren't you glad? In Christ, we have someone to hold us. If God did not keep us safe, we would not perish. We would, not, we, we would perish. We would perish. Hear this from John chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. Jesus is speaking, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And again in Romans, Paul says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. We are held in the hands of God, in Christ. Nothing can separate us from Christ. Nothing can separate us from God because Christ was God. And He, has, he is able to keep us. Beloved, do you think you could keep your salvation? Do you think you could work for it? Do you think you could earn it? Do you think there's merit in you enough to warrant that the sins that you have committed against a holy God would be forgiven? And that the righteousness is required by a holy God for you to be accepted of Him, that you could somehow merit that righteousness? Of course not. Comes through Christ. Because on the cross He died and in His deity He was able to save us because He was God, very God. But in His humanity He was able to identify with us. Which brings us to the second point. And that is we have someone to hear us. The writer of Hebrews says we, are, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and, and grace to help in the time of need. The words here, touched with feeling, comes from the Greek, sympathio. It means to be affected with the same feeling as another. It is a kind of empathy. Nothing helps someone more than to hear someone when you're, when you're having trouble, nothing helps you more than to listen to someone who's already been through that trouble and has triumphed over it. I was listening to this commercial about, uh, I think it was alcohol, uh, helping people recover from alcoholism, and they said, on our staff, we have a total of 5,000 months of sobriety. What are they saying? Five, we have, our staff is, I don't know how big their staff is. They might not be saying a lot, I don't know. But I think they're saying it to make a point. We have 5,000 months where we have been victorious over this addiction. We can help you. That's what they're saying. Jesus is saying, I have defeated sin the grave and hell itself. I've defeated Satan. You overcome through me because I have won the victory and I am with you. He is our sympathetic high priest. He couldn't do that if he had not been the God-man. If he had not come to seek as God, he came down to seek. Came into a human form to seek, to live among us, to be like us, to seek. And then as God, He came to save that which was lost because as God, He has the ability and the power and the capacity to save sinners who cannot save themselves. And finally, he, we have someone to help us. In all things, it behooved Him to be made like unto His brethren. Listen to this. 
that he be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, is able to succor them that are tempted. Beloved, he had to be a human being to suffer like us, and yet without sin. Suppose Jesus had only been human. How could he have helped us? He couldn't have saved us. His sympathy would have been of little avail. Not good to have somebody sympathize with you that can't help you. But then suppose he had not been God. Then there would be no divine power to help us. So here it is. Because he is human, he is willing to help us. And because he is God, he is able to help us. What a great doctrine. What a great doctrine. The doctrine of the hypostatic union that Jesus Christ, as he said, came to seek and to save the lost. And that Jesus Christ is able to hold on to his people that they might endure until the end. Henry Ward Beecher said, The night was long and the shadows spread as far as the eye could see. I stretched my hands to a human Christ, and he walked through the dark with me. Out of the dimness as, la as, as last we came, our feet on the dawn warm sod, and I saw by the light of his wondrous eyes, I walked with the Son of God. What a doctrine. And as Christians, beloved, we need to be able to defend this doctrine and affirm this doctrine, because without, without a Christ who came in humanity to seek us and to identify with us, and without God who was able to save us, then we're left to ourselves. And we're not able to save ourselves. Let's stand for prayer. Oh Lord. We stand before you this, this morning amazed at your great work, at your great plan, the plan of redemption. Lost by the fall of Adam and Eve. Willful, seeking to rebel against you. Seeking to be like gods ourselves, creating idols by the thousands. We groped in darkness. As the song says, the Christmas song, long lay the world in sin and error pining until he appeared. The glorious light appeared and the darkness cannot overcome it, John says. The light who is the Logos. The light who is God incarnate. The one who came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And here the story comes full end. Oh, I think about all the texts in the Old Testament and the New Testament where Jesus said, Before Moses... I am. No one has seen the Father except the Son who, who has descended. All of these great texts that tell us of your preexistent glory and then remind us as Paul tells us in Philippians that you did not grasp being in heaven and being fully God that you came down to save sinners. 
like us. What a glorious truth. What joy we have because we have you and we're in your hand. I pray this morning for those who are here who perhaps have not trusted in Christ as their Savior, who are trying to save themselves some way, somehow. I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, that you might open their eyes and their hearts to this glorious truth that Christ came to save sinners and that only through Him and His work, His accomplished work, can we know and have a relationship with you. And I pray for us as believers, I pray that we would not only affirm this truth, but that we would study this truth and own this truth and teach others. For your glory we pray. Amen. You've been a wonderful congregation. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.